On a snowy winter night, a cyber cafe is filled to the brim with customers. Everyone is enjoying their time except one guy, who is an employee at the cafe. He received a phone call from his girlfriend, telling him that they should break up. Accepting things as they are, he doesn't resist or try to convince her to stay and simply agrees with her. Hearing this, she feels oddly insulted and asks him if he ever truly loved her since he's not trying to win her back. Losing his mind at his insane leech of a girlfriend, he lets loose and tells her that he fell for her because she was sweet and pure. But now, she had changed or rather, showed her true colors as a gold digger who fell for a millionaire just three days into college. Have some dignity and respect yourself, he says before hanging up on her. Heartbroken, he stares out the window into the dark snowy night. His manager shows up and tells him that it's time for a shift change. Handing him the month's salary, he advises him to go rest and leave the cafe management to him. The guy excitedly counts his salary and notices that there's some extra money in it. Being the honest little wimp that he is, he asks the manager about the extra money, thinking that it might have been a mistake. The manager assures him that the real mistake was what his parents made when giving birth to him. The manager adds that he knows that the guy just had a breakup and so, out of care, he added the extra money so that he could cheer himself up, crying like a drama queen. The guy says it's his seventh breakup and asks for even more money to compensate for the other six breakups. The manager tells him to stop his yapping and leave before he breaks up his bones instead. The guy packs his things and leaves. On his way back, his phone rings again. Thinking that it's his ex-girlfriend calling again to get some attention, he picks up the call and immediately starts spouting some Sigma male nonsense calling her a dumb bitch. It's all fun and games till the dumbass realizes that the call was actually from his father. After the world's worst attempt at a cover-up, he tells his father that it was someone else on the street who said those things. At any rate, he excitedly tells his father that he won the second prize in a raffle and got just enough money to pay for his studies. Crossing the street, he adds that he is really lucky. Just then, God sends him a divine fuck you from above in the form of a truck. Seeing the incoming speeding truck, he rushes to save a little girl who was in the way. Just in the nick of time, he saves the little kid but at a dire cost. He got hit by the truck instead and bled out on the street. As his soul leaves his body, the bystanders gather around, horrified by the accident. Unable to do a thing, his soul gets sucked into the sky and the next thing he knows, he's standing at the gates of a strange realm, walking through the seemingly divine realm mindlessly. He eventually crosses paths with a giant and ominous being. The guy, Jai Ning, finds out that the being has come to receive him at the orders of the Lord of Kiwi Palace. Jai Ning jumps onto the being's hand, like a fancy Uber, and they set forth on their path. At the palace, surrounded by floating bookshelves, Jai Ning looks around in astonishment while Lord Kiwi goes through a book. Gazing at a poster, he can't believe his eyes when the woman on it starts moving and throws an object that gets absorbed into his body, emanating an odd glow. Lord Ku draws his attention back with a firm scolding. He yells at him, saying that Jai Ning died too early. He was supposed to live for another 80 years according to the Book of Life and Death. Jai Ning angrily retorts back, questioning how it could be his fault for dying too early. Nobody wants to die after all. He demands to be sent back to life with 8 million as compensation. Lord Kui sees his point but unfortunately, the rules can't be changed. Jai Ning cannot go back to his life. Instead, Lord Kui offers him some good options for reincarnation. A successful military general, a genius scholar, or an emperor. To his dismay, Jai Ning rejects them all and requests something simpler. He only wants a rich and lazy life with lots of women and no responsibility. Taken aback by his deranged claims, Lord Kui is shocked to realize that he is just a useless pervert. At any rate, Jai Ning is given an offer that lives up to his standards. Lord Kui takes him to the Bridge of Life. He must cross the bridge, drink the elixir of forgetfulness, and then he can begin his new life. Jai Ning, wondering if Lord Kui is lying or not, decides to trust him anyway and crosses the bridge. There, a woman, surrounded by many doors, awaits him. She offers him the elixir of forgetfulness and instructs him to drink it. Jai Ning's eyes well up with tears as he realizes that after that moment, he'll forget everything, including the cherished memories of his parents. Things take a turn for the worse when a dragon beast, along with its army of dragons, erupts from under the bridge and wreaks havoc. The woman summons her followers and takes on the beast in a deadly battle. The bridge, along with the doors to reincarnation, began to collapse. She calls out to Jai Ning, telling him to run. Jai Ning throws caution to the wind and rushes to the first door he saw, without drinking the elixir of forgetfulness. The chaos subsides, and later, the woman asks Lord Kui what kind of man Jai Ning is since his presence alone caused such chaos. 
Lord Kiwi tells her that he fears the three realms will no longer be at peace. On the other side, Jining gets reincarnated as the newborn son of an emperor. Fully conscious with his memory intact, Jining looks forward to his new life of luxury. Fifteen whole years have passed and the newborn Jining is now a teenager enjoying a life of luxury. As a prince, all he does is slack off, feast, and enjoy himself. One such day, at the emperor's dining table, Jai Ning chows down bowls of food as if he's never eaten anything before. Surrounded by two pretty servants, he indulges in the food, regardless of manners. His father, the emperor, and mother watch in shock, worried by their heir's immaturity. Having eaten his share, Jai Ning gets up and announces that he's going outside to practice martial arts, accompanied by the two beautiful servants. His mother turns to the emperor, Yi Chuan, in her worry but he assures her that they'll go to see him later. At the training grounds, Jai Ning, instead of practicing, lays down in the field and gets massaged by the two servants, who ask why he isn't training like he said he would. Jai Ning obviously wanted them to massage his little prince but knew his ugliness would get him rejected. Instead, he makes up an excuse that he knows the way of martial arts and since he already trained for two hours, he deserves some rest. Jai Ning drifts off into slumber and, meanwhile, Yi Chuan oversees the training of his army. Zhu, his wife, brings up the topic of Jai Ning again. She expresses concern that, given Jai Ning's current condition and demeanor, he is unfit to guide the people of the West Prefecture, a responsibility Yi Chuan intended to pass on to him. Yi Chuan remembers a conversation he had with Brother Lai when Jai Ning was born. Lai cast doubt upon Jai Ning's eligibility to inherit the throne. He mentioned that Jai Ning's skills are ordinary and he doesn't have what it takes to lead their people. Mentioning that Yi Chuan had ruled for a very long time, Lai reminded him of the rules of their prefecture. Yi Chuan assured him that he would not pass the throne to Jai Ning just because Jai Ning was his son. Instead, Jai Ning's strength would decide whether or not he deserves it. In the case that Jai Ning failed, Yi Chuan promised to leave the throne. In the present, Yi Chuan decides that he will not allow his nation to be ruined at the hands of Jai Ning if he proves to be undeserving. As things are right now, Jai Ning doesn't take practice seriously, so to teach him a lesson and test his skills, Yi Chuan tells Zhu that he intends to send Jai Ning to Kun Long. Zhu gets worried but Yi Chuan reassures her that Jai Ning's talent and spiritual potential are very impressive for his age and undertaking this challenge would make him stronger. Unconvinced, Zhu requests him to wait till Jai Ning is a bit older as this task may prove too dangerous for a mere 15-year-old. Yi Chuan brings out the boomer response saying back in my day we had to survive at that age. Jai Ning ate that special and orders her to go and make him a sandwich. Yi Chuan makes his way to the training ground where Jai Ning is sleeping. The two servants wake him up saying that the emperor is coming. Jai Ning immediately gets up and pretends that he has been practicing all along. Yi Chuan is like cut the bullshit I know your dumbass was sleeping. Anyway, Yi Chuan mentions Jai Ning's desire to explore and train in the outside world beyond the empire. He offers Jai Ning an opportunity to gain his trust and have his wish come true. The catch is that Jai Ning must first prove himself by defeating the demon beast that resides inside Kun Long. If he fails, he must focus earnestly on his training. Jai Ning confidently takes up the challenge. Later, Jai Ning followed by his parents and Lai, approach the gates of Kun Long. Zhu cautions Jai Ning to be careful as the demon will attack him with all his might. The gates open and Jai Ning assures her that everything will be alright. Yi Chuan makes it clear that he will not step in to help under any circumstances and that Jai Ning must beat the mystical beast. Jai Ning steps inside the arena, unsure what kind of beast awaits him. A snake, restricted by shackles, slithers out into the arena. Seeing the snake Jai Ning relaxes. Surely a small snake would be easy to defeat. The shackles are removed and to Jai Ning's dismay, the snake transforms into a bigger, more powerful form. Jai Ning looks scared and Lai picks up on it, saying that Jai Ning doesn't seem to have a bright future ahead. But Yi Chuan tells him that the real snake here is you, shut up and watch before he smack his micro snake. Jai Ning calms down and trades a few blows with the snake demon. He tries to come up with a strategy to defeat the beast. Yi Chuan looks down at the fight, approving of his son's strength and cunning while Lai continues to whine like a toddler. At that moment, Jai Ning engulfs himself in the crimson aura of the Nine Heavens, a high-level technique that impresses everyone. Lai watches in shock and remarks that it would normally take someone 30 years to master that move. Jai Ning strikes a fatal blow at the snake demon but it only enrages it more, transforming it into an even more powerful version of himself, shocking Lai because he had put a seal on the beast to prevent this. 
Before the situation grows out of control, Yichuan throws his sword into the arena, advising Jai Ning to turn it into his mystical weapon and vanquish the beast. Jai Ning grabs the sword and, combined with his blood, the blade turns into jade. He lunges forward and with a powerful attack, kills the snake demon. Yichuan proudly points at his victorious son and tells Lai that his objections are wrong and that his son will be a great king. Elsewhere, the father of the snake demon was furious and very angry at the death of his son and he vows to take revenge on them. Chaos ensues in the West Prefecture as the winged snake demon retaliates. To take revenge for the death of his son, the snake demon launches a full-on assault, commanding many other beasts. They make their way through the city, destroying everything that stands between them and claiming many innocent lives in the process. While the smaller demons cause destruction on the ground, the winged snake makes his way to Kun Long where his son was killed. A soldier rushes to Kun Long and reports everything to Governor Yi Chuan. He explains that they're under attack and the demons are charging towards the fortress with the express purpose of taking revenge. Before Yi Chuan could process the situation, the winged snake arrived at Kun Long. Seeing the dead body of his son, the winged snake locks his sights on Jai Ning, demanding that the young man should pay with his life. He rushes down the chain ceiling of Kun Long, breaking it down with ease. Yi Chuan yells at Jai Ning to run away to someplace safe, but the young prince doesn't listen. The snake demon blocks the path to escape and roars, ready to fight. Meanwhile, the other demons surround Yi Chuan, Zhu, Bai, and Lai. The situation seems dire as Jai Ning gets pushed to a corner while the rest are surrounded by hostile demons. Seeing Yi Chuan worry for Jai Ning's safety, Lai steps up and tells him to go help Jai Ning and leave the rest to him. Lai takes offense at the audacity of mere demons to challenge the Jai clan. However, he sees that Jai Ning could prove as a valuable leader for the clan in the future and entrusts his safety to Yi Chuan. Lai unsheathes his sword and begins slicing down the demons with swift blows, leaving a blue aura behind. Zhu charges up powerful magic spells that instantly chop the demons in half, leaving their corpses on the ground. Bai, on the other hand, is like, catch these hands bitch and uses his fists to punch through the enemies. Yi Chuan rushes to aid his son because that little baboon would die without his help. Meanwhile, Jai Ning faces off alone against the formidable winged snake. Trying to find an opening, he lunges into the air and unleashes his drizzling rain sword technique. Channeling the technique's strength, he strikes the snake, only for his attack to be blocked. The snake retaliates and chops Jai Ning's arm off in one clean strike. With the odds stacked against him, Jai Ning rushes to the arena's walls and runs while trying to come up with a better plan. He spots his chopped arm flying through the air and, using a magic technique, he reattaches the limb, making it as good as new. Glad that his training paid off, Jai Ning relaxes a little but the snake's attacks are relentless. Just when another attack is about to connect, Yi Chuan comes to the rescue. Using the same crimson aura technique, he fends off the attack, buying precious time for his son to regain his footing. Yi Chuan continues to fight while Jai Ning retreats to safety. Lai, Zhu, and Bai regroup with Jai Ning. Zhu is relieved to see that her son is unharmed and embraces him in a warm hut. Being the mommy's boy that he is, Jai Ning immediately yaps about how he almost became disabled when the snake cut his arm off and only survived because of the magic technique. At any rate, Zhu is proud of how skilled her son is. Jai Ning turns his attention back towards the snake and asks everyone to come help Yi Chuan. Lai, however, assures him that it's not a problem. Only the winged snake is left and a mere beast like that is no match for Yi Chuan, so they can rest easy. Sure enough, Yi Chuan dominates the battle enough to make the winged snake retreat in fear. While trying to escape, the snake retorts that the Jai clan killed his son first. It's only reasonable that he sought revenge. Yi Chuan has no intention of letting the snake escape, at least not alive. He manifests a bow and fires off an arrow at the snake. One arrow alone proves insufficient to end the giant snake so Yi Chuan hops on his bird and follows the winged snake. The battle continues and when he finally catches up to the snake, he fires off a volley of arrows, all aimed perfectly. The winged snake takes multiple hits and falls into the river below. In the western prefecture, Jai Ning and Zhu walk through the streets, witnessing the unprecedented disaster the attack brought upon them. Jai Ning asks Zhu why his father hasn't returned yet. Zhu assures him that the winged snake is no match for Yi Chuan, though she admits that the snakes can be tricky and devious to deal with. She tells him that Yi Chuan won't rest easy and return till he hunts down the snake. Jai Ning hesitantly agrees with the winged snake's complaint. They did kill the snake's son first. It's not unreasonable that he wanted revenge. In a sense, its thirst for revenge was justified. Zhu immediately retorts back, her words like a stern slap to the face, that Jai Ning is supposed to be the next governor one day. Such weak thoughts would make him un fit to protect their people. She's thinking, I should have aborted this dumb monkey, regardless of whether the snake had a reason to attack or not. 
The governor's responsibility is to protect and fight for his people no matter what. She points to the bloody corpses lying on the streets and questions Jai Ning if those innocents did anything wrong. Did they deserve to die? The snake demon, in his blind rage for revenge, killed without distinction between the innocent and those actually responsible for the death of his son. Unable to come up with an answer, Jai Ning stays quiet. Sometime later, Q Yi informs Jai Ning that the father of Chun Kao, his servant, has come to take her home. Jai Ning was shocked at that statement considering that Chun Kao was apparently an orphan. Q Yi insists that her biological father has come and wants to see the prince to get permission to take her away. He asks if Chun Kao is aware of the whole matter and Q Yi answers in the affirmative, though she adds that Chun Kao didn't dare to come and see him. Without a moment's delay, Jai Ning sets out to sort the matter and see the man claiming to be her biological father. Sitting on his chair, he finds the man and Chun Kao kneeling before him. He tells them to get up and explain the situation. The man explains that he is the leader of a small tribe. When the attacks from the snake demon started, the tribe disbanded and people ran in different directions to save themselves. In that chaos, he left Chun Kao in the protection of the Jai clan so that she may live peacefully, safe from all the danger. Meanwhile, he directed his efforts toward reuniting the tribe, a task that proved to be a lot more difficult than expected. Now, given the recent attacks on the Jai clan and the snake's vendetta against them, Chun Kao can no longer be be safe there so he has come to take her back with him. Moreover, the Black Fang clan has been rebuilt, so it is time for Chun Kao to return home. After hearing the man's request, Jai Ning turns to Chun Kao and asks her if she wishes to return. With tears in her eyes, she immediately blurts out that she does not want to leave. The man tells her to stop being a silly bitch because she would die here. On some girl boss stuff, Chun Kao pops off, saying that she's not afraid to die and she'd rather be with the prince when she has to die. Jai Ning chimes in saying, that she should go home or I'm sending you to the psych ward instead because it's better to live her life instead of wishing to die with a lazy loser like him. Tears stream down her cheeks as she admits that she'd die of sadness if she left his side. Jai Ning, moved by her words, accepts that she has accompanied him for years. Being separated from her would only fill his heart with sadness too. But, being practical, he agrees that it is best if she leaves till things are safe again. He reassured her, saying that she should think of it as seeking refuge for a while rather than leaving forever. Sometime later, Yi Chuan calls Jai Ning to his room. Looking out the window, he waits for Jai Ning to arrive. When he finally arrives, Yi Chuan hands him an odd object, adorned with jade. Jai Ning inquires what it is and Yi Chuan explains that it is called an amulet of persecution. It is activated by squeezing it and it allows Yi Chuan to come to his aid whenever needed. There are limitations though. The amulet only works within a radius of 10,000 kilometers of the city so Jai Ning can't go further than that. The hamsters inside Jai Ning's pea-sized brain spin the wheels and the dumbass finally figures out that his father is allowing him to go outside the city to explore and train, just like he always wanted to. He is overjoyed to hear this and rushes to prepare his things. Zhu, on the other hand, asks Yi Chuan if that is the wisest decision to make as the snake demon isn't dead yet. So, the danger of letting Jai Ning go out is clear. Yi Chuan assures her that it'll be fine. He realizes that Jai Ning possesses extraordinary potential and skills but the only thing he lacks is experience and maturity. Yi Chuan hopes that going to train in the outside world, Jai Ning would face difficulties and in the process of beating them, would learn and grow from them mentally. Elsewhere, Chun Kao is in her depressed emo phase and looks dejected about having to leave the prince. Her father shows up and assures her that he is only doing this for her well-being and safety. She explains that leaving the prince when things got difficult would mean that later he would not see her the same way. Their conversation comes to an abrupt end as her father yells at her to run. A giant snake beast flies over their heads. Jai Ning finally sets out to the outside world, making his way through the lush scenery and breathtaking vistas. He rushes forward, leaving Bai and Qiu Yi, who are accompanying him, behind to worry. Qiu Yi raises her concern to Bai that the East Mountain Marsh they are in right now is the territory of the Azure Sky Snake. Marching on without a care in the world could likely leave them exposed to danger. Under these circumstances, she wonders if bringing the prince there is a good idea. Bai assures him that Swallow Mountain is a huge place and there is no area that the powerful Jai clan cannot go to. If a problem arises, they'll simply crush it. That being said, Bai stretches and admires the beauty of the place. He lays down on the grass and rests while Qi Yi continues to bother him about the prince's safety, urging him to follow Jai Ning. But Bai tells him to, Shut up, bitch, let me have my beauty sleep. It ain't easy to slay so hard. Meanwhile, Jai Ning makes his way further into the area and finds himself near the river. There, his eyes are drawn toward a nest on the tree with small birds. Climbing on the tree to get a closer look, he's suddenly startled by a snake that appears out of nowhere. 
He falls down on his ass and hears someone laughing at him. Looking around, he spots a girl giggling and asks her what it is that she finds so funny. She continues to laugh and calls him a fool. Getting defensive, Jai Ning tries to explain himself, saying that if she saw that hideous snake, she'd get scared and fall down just like him. The girl takes offense to that statement and immediately gets irritated. She argues that the snake is actually very beautiful, and the prince tells her that she is focusing on the wrong point. Beautiful or not, it's a snake nonetheless, so she should focus on his snake instead. However the girl doesn't accept his reasoning and demands that he apologize to the snake and tell her that she is very beautiful or face the consequences. Jia Ning just stares blankly and questions her lack of brain cells. Calling her demented, he refuses to apologize until the girl transforms into the very snake that scared him off the tree. His demeanor went from Sigma male to a little wimp real quick. Nearby, two dudes are up to no good. This ominous duo, practicing some kind of magic ritual, talks about how they've already arranged a yin-yang spell to capture and control the azure sky snake. Their attention is drawn by the sound of fighting nearby and they rush to check what's causing the commotion. On reaching the lakeside, they find the prince engaged in a fierce battle with the azure sky snake and playfully remark that someone had already lured the snake into their trap. The duo hides nearby and observes the fight unfold before rushing to make any decisions. While observing, one of them notes that Jia Ning can perform two different actions at once. With one hand, he wields the sword while with the other, he uses powerful techniques. The man, Ironwood Jan, who had been dwelling in the forest for many years had never seen something like this and was deeply impressed by Jia Ning's skills. The other man notices that Jia Ning is using the Jia Clan's drop cloak technique. They wonder who the young man is, unaware that he is actually Jai Ning, the prince of the Jai clan. Jai Ning jumps into the air and aims for a lethal attack on the Azure Sky Snake. But just because the attack connects, he diverts his sword away since he doesn't actually intend to harm her. One of the men mistakes this maneuver to be a lack of skill, but Ironwood Jan corrects him, saying that it takes tremendous mastery to be able to divert an attack like that. They continue to watch carefully, adding the young man to their schemes. Meanwhile, Jai Ning fends off the Azure Sky Snake while trying to reason with her. He makes it clear that he has no ill intentions towards her but she ought to realize that fighting over something so insignificant is stupid. He asks her to stop being so superficial like human beings to take offense over minor things. Finally, he warns her that if she continues to be a menace to society, threatening people over petty things, he won't show any mercy to her anymore. The Azure Sky Snake doesn't take fondly to those condescending words and turns its assault up a notch. Charging towards Jai Ning, it pushes him back with a piercing attack. Knocked back toward the river, Jai Ning uses his honed skills to walk on the water. Floating and gathering energy, he uses it to heal the ribs that got crushed by the snake's attack. He immediately charges back, taking the fight back to the snake. She transforms back into her human form and continues the fierce battle, neither side ready to back off. Jai Ning remarks how painfully difficult it is to reason with a woman. Jai Ning and the Azure Sky Snake continue to fight pointlessly, neither relenting in their aggression while Ironwood Jan and his accomplice continue to scheme. They wait for the two fighters to walk right into their trap, not caring if the young prince dies a pointless death in the process. A clash of swords ensues between Jai Ning and the Azure Sky Snake in her human form. Blocking each other's slashes, they immediately slash back with a deadly strike of their own. The girl transforms back into snake form and charges towards Jai Ning. Walking on water, Jai Ning welcomes her attack with an upward slash from his sword, sending a wave of water with it. The wave soaks Ironwood Jan and his accomplice, leaving them with grim faces filled with annoyance. On the other hand, the girl is forced to revert back to her human form. She pushes Jai Ning back, and before he can notice it, he gets engulfed in an odd red aura. This is the moment Ironwood Jan was waiting for. The prince had fallen into his trap, and the Azure Sky Snake was rushing in too. Jan activates his Yin Yang spell while Jai Ning yells out to the Azure Sky Snake, warning her that a trap awaits her and that she should make haste to escape. She doesn't listen, and in the blink of an eye, she gets entrapped in the yin yang spell. The spell restrains her, causing her skin to burn and leaving scorch marks behind. She screams in agony, but before Jai Ning can do anything to help her, the accomplice rushes at mock speed and attacks him. Barely blocking the blow, Jai Ning knows that the situation is dire. But that was just the beginning of his trouble as the accomplice transforms into a giant, menacing beast. Pushed to the limits, Jai Ning demands to know who the unknown men are. He calls out to Jan, asking who he is but to no avail. The Azure Sky Snake answers, despite suffering in the trap, that the man is Ironwood Jan, a late-stage Xianchen expert. She warns him that he will not be able to win against Jan so it's best for him to save his own skin and run away. 
Jai Ning tells her. Bitch, I already wanted to do that. You're too ugly to die for. Rushing towards the beast, Jai Ning hightails it out of there. The beast tries to pursue him in an attempt to prevent him from escaping, but he proves too agile to catch and slips away into the forest. Jan tells the beast to let him go as their main target was the Azure Sky Snake anyway. Inflicting excruciating pain on the girl, Ironwood Jan demands her to surrender and become his spirit beast so he can start her only fans and get rich. The resilient snake, however, refuses, telling him to keep dreaming. Jan chuckles and informs her that the Yin Yang spell is immensely powerful, with energy that cannot be compared with anything else. Given the nature of the spell, even he cannot control it completely for a long time, so if she continues to resist, she'll end up scorched to ashes. But the snake replies that she'd rather be reduced to dust than be someone's slave. Jan doesn't approve of that answer and increases the pain being inflicted upon her. Watching from afar, Jai Ning curses Jan's cruelty and tries to haphazardly rush back into battle. Bai arrives and stops Jai Ning from making a foolish move. He advises Jai Ning that the aggression he is displaying far exceeds his capabilities. He should not be so arrogant as that'll only result in defeat. Seeing Bai, Jai Ning immediately thinks of a way to slack off, being the lazy bitch he is. He suggests that surely Bai is far stronger than Ironwood Jan, so Bai should go save the little girl. He adds that the Azure Sky Snake is stubborn and immature but she doesn't actually have any ill intentions. Bai assures him that the snake is strong, she will not die so easily and suggests that Jai Ning should use that time to come up with a better strategy. Having said that, Bai reminds him that this is his training and vanishes without a trace. Seeing no other way, Jai Ning meditates in an attempt to find a breakthrough. Sitting calmly, he gets struck by an epiphany when he notices the wind blowing the leaves away. The leaves have no roots, when the breeze touches them, they simply fly away. Similarly, if the wind was strong enough, even a tree would be uprooted and dragged away, regardless of how strong its trunk is. The lotus leaves in front of him, however, are different. They sway with the wind, reducing the momentum of the incoming breeze. Jai Ning realizes a principle of nature, if the movement is calm, it can be flexible. Only then can one guarantee survival. Closing his eyes, he meditates on how to apply a similar rule to himself. He begins to make a spiritual breakthrough, and energy in the shape of a lotus flower forms over him, radiating powerful currents. Bai watches this from afar with a sense of pride and happiness over Jai Ning's growth. He wonders if, in this dire situation, Jai Ning has achieved something special. The night has fallen and Jai Ning is still deep in meditation. Thinking about some perverted shit, he'll either level up or jizz. Rays of red and blue energy have gathered around him, floating calmly like the water. He continues to strengthen his newly awakened technique while Bai and Q Yi watch from above a tree. The forest is inhabited by wolves, and once night falls, they set out on their prowl. One such wolf comes across Jai Ning, who is too engrossed in his meditation to notice. Q Yi signals an alert to Bai, implying that they should go help him. Bai rejects her idea and advises her to watch carefully. The wolf locks its sights on Jai Ning and begins running towards him with its fangs bare. As the wolf lunges forward to attack him, the rays of energy gather around and like blades, slice the wolf to bloody bits. Kyuyi watches in awe. The prince's lotus flower technique far exceeds their expectations. Even Bai is impressed by its fierceness. Meanwhile, Ironwood Jan continues his attempts to break the Azure Sky Snake, forcing her to become his slave. He's like, call me daddy and warns her that if she doesn't give up her stubborn resistance, he will extinguish her soul and destroy her body. Even that chilling threat elicits no response from the snake. She's not into that kinky hentai shit. His accomplice suggests that trying to convince the snake seems futile. Jan agrees that it seems futile. The snake would not abandon its determination and pointlessly suffer unbounded pain. He notices something else in the air, a strange energy indicating that someone else is nearby. Jan orders his accomplice to investigate the matter while he finds a way to make the snake submit. He warns that the energy seems to be from a swift and fierce person, advising caution to his accomplice. Jan decides that the energy might prove too strong for just one person to deal with, so he decides to go along and defeat it. They leave the Azure Sky Snake behind to suffer and eventually die from the spell. Jan and his accomplice, still in the form of a beast, navigate through the forest and reach the source of the energy. There, they find Jai Ning, still meditating, almost at the brink of perfecting the lotus technique. Jan's eyes widen with shock and fear as he realizes that Jai Ning managed to manifest such potent energy in its true form. The energy surrounding Jai Ning was in its purest form, down to bare elemental energy, a masterful yet frightening technique. 
Regaining his composure, Jan understands that it is best to be calm in the moment and test out the enemy first. He grabs a rock and hurls it towards the prince. The rock gets shattered to bits but jolts Jai Ning awake from his meditation. Horrified by the power, Jan manifests a flame whip and hurls a tree towards Jai Ning. Jai Ning stands up, with a roaring threat. He unleashes a punch imbued with his new power and breaks the incoming tree in half. Jan, impressed by him, says that at this rate, this young member of the Jai clan might become worthy of his arrogant behavior. He adds that it'll be a pity that such a day will never arrive as he has no intention of letting Jai Ning leave alive. He plans to deny the Jai clan this talent and readies himself for a battle. Jai Ning proudly declares that yesterday or tomorrow doesn't matter to him. He only cares for the precise moment they are in. At that moment, he claims that the heavens had given him the knowledge to vanquish Shan. Proclaiming himself as the one who'll act out the judgment of the heavens, Jai Ning warns Shan that his death is imminent. Jai Ning's eyes change colors, embodying the two elements that his lotus technique uses. The power of water and fire manifests itself around the prince as he stands menacingly, ready to unleash his wrath upon Jan and his accomplice, and he tells him to get ready for his overpowered cheeks clapping jutsu.